Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. It's 9 o'clock. I imagine people will still be drifting in from breakfast. Um, but since you've got a reasonable amount of material to get through, we might as well start. Um, my name is James Bottomley. I am currently a sort of container evangelist for IBM. Um, originally, when I worked for Parallels, which is how I got into containers, I was more an open source advocate about converting business to open source. So I was more a business person than a technology person. And for a long time, I've actually been a kernel developer. I'm still a SCSI subsystem maintainer, PA RISC architecture maintainer. Those two are pretty much nominal titles. So Helge Della does all the work in PA RISC. I didn't even do anything. And Martin does all the work in SCSI subsystem. But because I send the pull request to Linus, I take all the credit. And obviously, I've done a lot of work in Linux containers. And one that's missing from the bottom is I'm now into security technologies like TPM as well. So if you've actually been following what I've been doing recently, it's almost all been about TPM. And I have a slight confession to make. Because this, is, this talk says it's about exploring the frontiers in containers, this is sort of partially true. But if you came to see a detailed description of IBM's new Nabla container technology, I'm actually not going to be giving you that. I'm going to be giving you the story of how we actually got to the point where we knew a technology like Nabla was necessary. Because uh, this talk is going to be primarily about assessing security in virtual environments. But before that, let's just start with the container basics. I assume I can fly through this since most of you are familiar. But uh, the difference between a container and a hypervisor is where the fundamental interface is. The hypervisor fundamental interface is at the virtual hardware level. So hypervisors are all about emulating hardware. And that means that you can bring anything up that can actually talk to the hardware. So you know, a Windows kernel in a virtual environment, a Linux kernel in a virtual environment, and so on. Containers are all about virtualizing the operating system subsystem itself. So for containers, the interface is the syscall interface of whatever operating system the container is running on. Everything below that interface belongs to the service provider, belongs to the guy who's hosting the container. And the reason why, if you, if you look at the container's revolution today, it's basically everything is Linux. There is no, really no other type of container. If you get container history, it's a long, involved, critically complicated thing that nobody's actually managed to sort out and which everybody claims to have a piece. So I'm not going to go into that. All I'm going to tell you is the reason all containers are Linux today is because of the hardness guarantees of the Linux syscall interface. If that interface hadn't been fantastically hard and fairly immutable from Linux kernel to Linux kernel, containers today would not work. The reason you don't have a decent container operating system on, Lin on Windows is because their interface is just not hard enough. F going from Windows release to Windows release, the ABI changed. There were bits of user space that required bits in the kernel and vice versa. And that makes it very difficult to bring up containers on Windows. We can bring up containers on Linux because the syscall interface is just so hard, basically because we didn't control it. And obviously, this means the main difference between hypervisors and containers is containers are a single kernel. Hypervisors are multiple kernels. Because for every hypervisor system, you have a host kernel and a guest kernel. And obviously, the immediate benefit to containers, which is why the technology is so beloved of the cloud, where everything wants to run lean, is if you have one kernel, you have one resource manager. So this gives us huge advantages to containers, like elasticity and so on. Um, so this is what a hypervisor looks like. Here's your hypervisor kernel running in the host, all this sort of big box is the host. You emulate one virtual hardware, set of virtual hardware for guest, and then the guest brings up its own kernel and runs an incredibly large stack on top. This is what containers look like. So it's similar to the hypervisor diagram. It's just slightly thinner. And in fact, these are what are called system containers. So you bring it up on the one piece of hardware. You have a single operating system kernel. And then for system containers, you start at the init system. And then we have what Docker allegedly claims to do but doesn't quite, which is you basically inherit the init system, the operating system, and the libraries from the outside. And all you bring up is a tiny boxed application. That should be your theoretical container description. And if you look at these, obviously this is a huge fat stack. This is a thinner stack, and this is a really thin stack to the tune of this one is usually gigabytes, and this one, if you get it right, is usually megabytes. And, but the key point about this is the resource sharing that having a single kernel actually enables is what gives you the agility of containers. It's what makes containers so tiny and so lean. 
not in terms of the actual image that you bring up, because if you've, most people have seen Docker images, they're not actually megabytes big, they're often sort of hundreds of megabytes, some are gigabytes big, but it gives you resource sharing inside the kernel, the great efficiency of memory management. And obviously it also gives you instant up or down scaling because you just ask the one kernel to do this for whatever uh, container you want to do it to. You don't have to inflate balloons, you don't have to do anything else. And this means the single kernel for containers makes resource decisions much more efficiently than hypervisors because in hypervisors, dis resource decisions have to be made across a hardware interface, but they're actually operating system decisions. So we invent all sorts of weird and wonderful virtual paravert hardware interfaces to try and communicate this information, but what usually ends up is the guest kernel ends up fighting with the host kernel for resources, which is why hypervisors end up being rather efficient. So I uh, presume most people in this room have heard of Docker. I believe it's quite popular in the container world now. Docker isn't really, it's sort of the thing that made Docker famous wasn't really being containers. It was actually finding a way of boxing up applications such that the application you box up and test on your laptop is exactly the same application environment you box up and deploy on the internet. This is what actually made Docker really useful. It's the transport of the environment from one place to another that allows this DevOps thing that all of the frothy container people are talking about to actually exist. This, by the way, will be the first and last time I mention DevOps because I'm interested in the fundamental technology. But for you to understand why the technology is useful, you have to understand that we have a connection to the frothy orchestration people who will talk all the time about DevOps. But the point is that Docker is really nothing more than an application packaging and transport system that was actually enabled by certain features in container technology. The fact that it's based on containers is just an added bonus. Oh, DevOps again. Uh, but it's basically all about easy deployment of boxed applications, easy image creation, easy testing, and seamless transport to a cloud environment where you're really unsure what everything else is running in. One of the dirty secrets of hypervisors is you think that a boxed virtual machine could do exactly the same thing, but it can't. Because if you take your virtual machine that I created on KVM on my laptop and try to deploy it, say, in the Amazon cloud, what you're actually going to find is there's a driver mismatch. I don't have exactly the right, right drivers to actually run in the Amazon cloud. So in, in theory, virtual machines could do exactly the same box deployment, but in practice, shifting the interface up to where it belongs in the kernel is what enabled this to just work seamlessly without having to work out, did I need to build my image with all these paravert drivers and everything else? That's why Docker works. In theory, Docker could all work with hypervisors today. Kata containers is actually a demonstration of that, but in practice, it's much more difficult to get it to work in a hypervisor technology. Now, here's the key crux of the talk. The great benefit of containers to everybody is this increased sharing. But the great threat that containers bring is increased sharing increases the security risk of the containment environment. The more I share, the more I'm vulnerable to everybody else who's sharing the same thing. And obviously this is a fact that hypervisor uh, owners seek to exploit. Because if you see all of the debates about hypervisor security versus container security, it goes something like this. Hypervised security is great because we have a tiny uh, hypercall interface. We don't get much footprint into the kernel. We have a really, really small footprint. It's very difficult to take something running in the guest and get it to exploit the host kernel just because of the hypervisor interface. So hypervisors are great. And then hypervisor advocates will tell you that you know containers are shit, right? Because the syscall interface is the most exploitable interface in Linux. There are 300 syscalls, any one of which is exposed to a container you could use to exploit. That exploit goes straight through to the host kernel. The entire physical system is compromised, and you can pull any piece of security information about any other tenant you can get. So hypervisors have some sort of container envy because containers have been ruling the world, but they're seeking to bring it back by effectively trying to make hypervisors great again. Yep, we've had to get that red hat phrase in there. But most of it is actually fake news. So most of it is about this security stuff. And what I'm going to try and do today is expose some of the fakery. So 
the real problem in this security debate is a complete lack of facts. So I gave you the crux of that debate, but I didn't give you one solid engineering fact in any of that debate. I waved my hands around and said things like surface penetration, hypercool, syscall interface, breadth of interface, therefore hypervisors good, containers bad is what it all amounts to. There is no intellectual rigor in any of these debates. And part of the problem is that we'll actually be doing that. See, 30 minutes, oh, we'll go over the containers API. So this is, if you actually orchestrate containers and understand it, this is how containers work in the Linux kernel. If you are a Kubernetes person, this is where your head explodes because you never actually need to understand any of this. But the great thing about containers is that every container system on the planet orchestrates using this interface. So LXC does it, Docker does it, uh, the Mesos, uh, container orchestration system does it, all new orchestration systems still use this interface. And this is actually quite an achievement if you think about the difference between us and hypervisors, because the two hypervisors we bring up on Linux, Zen and KVM, actually use completely separate in-kernel orchestration subsystems and work in completely separate ways. So getting all of the container people to agree to use the same interface is one of the great achievements of containers way back in 2011 when we came to this agreement at the kernel summit. So this API is the same. Uh, it came from the agreement at the kernel summit. It actually caused container interest to converge on a unified API, and it meant that we could all talk about containers and theoretically be on the same page book, even if one, one guy was working for Docker, one was working for Rocket, one was working for LXC, and so on. We were all talking about the same thing. And obviously, we didn't bifurcate our uh, development resources into two separate subsystems like Zen and KVM did. And it actually led directly to the ability of Docker to run upstream, and it's also fairly rapidly evolving. And obviously, uh, there are lots of C groups. I'm not going to go over them and name them all. These C groups' job is to control resources within the kernel. So it's to make resource control decisions for a container. And obviously, these C groups are all granular. They can be turned on and off at the whim of the container system. And this is one of the problem in containers. For virtual machines, you have a really hard description of what a virtual machine is, because it's whatever the virtual hardware is. For a container, you can actually choose to turn on or off any of these C groups or namespaces individually. Uh, namespaces, there are about seven of them now. There's network, IPC, MAN, PID, and so on. A namespace's job is to do a security separation of some sort of system interface within the Linux kernel. So for instance, the network namespace allows you to bring up fully separated network interfaces within the container. The mount namespace allows you to have a fully separated mount tree for each container. The PID namespace allows each container to have a PID1 running inside it. Uh, main reason for this is init gets very annoyed, or systemd gets very annoyed if it's not PID1. The UTS namespace just allows you to bring up NFS clients within the container. It virtualizes the kernel's view of the host name and the domain name and so on. The user namespace was recently, well, not recently, now it's sort of several years old, like about five years old, was introduced to actually get rid of the problem where real root runs inside a container. I think it was, uh, and the C group namespace, which was introduced in 4.6, was to try and actually make sure that we could bring up nested containers with all of these things. It's not actually been terribly successful so far. Um, the problem with this interface that you hear lots of Docker people tell you is it's almost impossible to use. As kernel people sitting in the room, you probably understand that actually it's quite easy to use and we do it all the time. If you look at how I orchestrate containers on my laptop, I basically create a few namespaces, bind it to, into the temporary file system and away I go. I don't really use any orchestration system. But the myth that the orchestration people present is that orchestration systems are required for containers. And being sort of good operating system people whose time has passed because we're essentially responsible for the plumbing, right? That's all they care about. We're the people who manage the drains. They manage the interesting stuff that tips shit into the drains. So we're the people in the thigh length waders. We just don't matter what we think. It's all about the orchestration system for container people. But the point I want to make about all of this is Docker is not the end of containers, it's actually just the beginning. There's a lot of interesting stuff to do in containers. And one of the big problems here is that Docker is the source of quite a few of our security issues. Certain issues that are hurled at us for containers actually don't exist if you build a container correctly. It's just because Docker doesn't actually build the container correctly. The reason is that right at the moment, most Docker instances don't use the user namespace. 
if you go to a cloud with a Docker image that requires root and you just run it on any random cloud, chances are you have the real system root running inside your container. If there's any containment escape, you don't even need to use a, 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 an exploit to, to do privilege elevation, you already have privilege. This is a bit of a security problem, and hypervisor people are obviously very keen to remind us of this. So, one of the things I was actually talking about in the containers microconference yesterday was actually how we get Docker to adopt uh, the user namespace and actually get rid of its root security problem. So this was the Shifterfest talk that we were doing. I'm not sure we'll actually do it that way, but as the plumbing guys, we're all on it. Um, as the frothy container guys, I'm sure they even don't know what we're doing, but we'll spoon feed it to them when we finally work out how to do it. But anyway, the point about this talk is countering the hype. And in order to actually make definitive statements about security, you actually need a way of measuring security. And this is the dirty little secret. Everybody talks about security. Nobody can give you a definitive way of measuring security. This is why security experts just can't agree, because even when security experts talk about security, they're usually talking about different things, and their different things they're talking about is usually their own personal opinion of whether this is secure or not. Because by and large, there is no definitive way of measuring this. So one of the things I gave my research group within IBM Research to do a while ago is come up with a definitive way of actually getting me a numerical measure of security. Can this actually be done? And we considered for a long time how we would actually do this, and we finally decided that the best way of actually measuring security, at least in the first approximation, was something called an attack profile. What an attack profile means is that um, if I have a stack that exposes itself to the internet and runs down and runs down and runs down and then finally hits physical hardware, every path that comes in from the web goes through a whole bundle of code, hits hardware, and then comes back through that bundle of code and gives you a response. Traversing that entire call path up and down potentially leads, allows you to run across various exploits, which are problems and the bugs in the code that we haven't actually found. And if the attacker is clever, any one of these potential exploits that are found in the stack can be used to gain control of your application to break out. So we concluded that the vertical attack profile was something like the number of lines of code that you would traverse going when the container or whatever it is is performing its normal operation multiplied by the approximate CVE density got from estimates. And so for the kernel, which is the, the shared component, this is roughly constant. So we just think of it as multiplying by a standard constant and we just chuck, chuck it away. So the attack profile is roughly the number of lines of code traversed. However, and this is where the discussion gets interesting, some of that attack profile belongs to the tenant and some belongs to the host. So in a hypervisor, everything, almost everything apart from the uh, hardware emulation system belongs to the tenant. So the tenant in a hypervisor system is responsible for much more of the vertical attack profile than the tenant in the container system. In a container system, the tenant's responsibility stops at the syscall interface. So the hosting provider is actually responsible for all of the shared kernel interfaces. So the actual vertical attack profile a tenant is responsible for in a container is much smaller than in a hypervisor, which is useful. But it doesn't mean the overall attack profile is smaller because uh, it is technically because there's actually less code in a, in a container than there is in a hypervisor. But the big problem is that there is a huge horizontal piece in a container, which is technically the responsibility of the hosting provider. No hosting provider tells you this. They all scream about, you know, you have to protect yourself on this interface. And in fact, most hosting providers would prefer you run in a hypervisor, not because it's easier or for you or it gives you more security, as they will claim, but because it makes you responsible for the guest kernel. So you are now responsible for all exploits in the guest kernel. Any hosting provider that allows you to run on their bare metal containers, they are responsible for all potential exploits in the kernel. So a lot of the security in that system becomes their responsibility. And this is why, as far as I know, there is only current one current cloud that actually sells you bare metal containers, and it was the IBM Bluemix cloud. And we did it because we wanted to prove to the world that it was actually possible to run a system where we would be responsible for a significant chunk of the security profile of the applications.
However, I'm not here to blow IBM's horn. I'm here to talk about this horizontal attack profile if you run native bare metal containers is the reason that hypervisor people claim it's so dangerous to do this. So we ran our cloud like this to prove that actually it wasn't as dangerous as you thought. But when we brought up the Bluemix cloud, we actually had no idea how big the danger was because there are no definitive statistics proving this. The only way we could actually tell if we had a problem was to expose the entire cloud to the internet and say, see, okay, who's going to hack us? That was, that's basically how we thought that, you know, this, there's something here that means that although hypervisor people can claim that containers are hundreds of times more vulnerable than hypervisors, when we actually exposed a bare metal container interface to the world, we did not get hundreds of times more exploits than a, than a hosting provider on hypervisors got. And there must be a reason for this. Trying to find out what the reason for this is is what led us down this research path and what led us to the attack profile concept, which is basically lines of code traversed. So, the overall chance of atta being attacked in the shared kernel, the horizontal profile, which is the thing which is really dangerous, because any exploit in this code is in shared code, I can use that exploit to go back up into another tenant's container, and I can compromise your entire system. So any horizontal exploit is potentially fatal to a hosting provider. And the horizontal profile is, in theory, the amount of exposed code in the Linux kernel multiplied by the potential bug density in that code. So here are the observations. Um, the measured horizontal attack profile of Docker versus that of CATA containers. And the way we measured this is we actually ran ftrace profiles of what were these, the system calls that were actually being made through KVM in the host CATA containers and what was actually being done by a, do a standard Docker application. And this is roughly what it looks like. These are for, uh, uh, sorry, you probably can't read these. But this is for a, a node test. This is, was a Redis test. And this is the Python tornado test. And and this is actually using ftrace to measure the lines of code traversed inside the kernel for those tests. First observation, the red line, uh, which is Docker, is Docker on bare metal in the kernel. The blue line, which is CATA, is CATA container. So it's basically a container on Docker running in KVM on the host. And all we're measuring is the profile of the host kernel. And contrary to what hypervisor people have long claimed, these two lines are not 100 times apart. They're roughly, if you look at, I mean, so obviously Docker is worse on every line. So that there is greater profile exposure in bare metal Docker on every line. But it's not that much greater than the profile exposure of KVM. These differences are at worst here, you're talking about 30%. At best here, you're talking about 10%. Right? This is not a factor of 100. And this is actually a security measurement of what's going on. Now, this security measurement is a bit of a lie because it's what's going on for a well-behaved application. Obviously, if I were going to prove the entire syscall interface, I wouldn't be running these tests. I'd be running a full fuzzer interface. But the point is that if I could constrain my Docker container with an adequate seccomp profile to only use these system calls, the amount of exposed code would pretty much match what my application is running. So I'm not promising you that Docker is completely secure, but I'm promising you that there is a way of securing Docker such that your risk matches pretty much what a hypervisor gets to within a tens of percent, not to within orders of magnitude like hypervisor people contain. But putting that security profile in place is still a huge problem. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. Com crafting good set comp profiles from Docker is horrible. It is an exercise that I think only Jesse Frizzell could love. But if you do it, you can get a uh, a horizontal attack profile for a container that is pretty much equivalent to the horizontal attack profile for a hypervisor. However, we're IBM Research. We didn't stop there. Once we'd measured this, and now we have a reason, we understand why our bare metal cloud was not attacked hundreds of times more than a standard hosting cloud. We, if we measure the amount of people trying to attack it, the, the people who actually managed to get exploits in looks about the same as any public cloud that ran hypervisors. So our attack actual, uh, our, our empirical data was that we seem to be about as secure as a public cloud. And this is what this uh, profile is backing up. There is actually a scientific measurable reason why we didn't get hundreds of times more exploits than hypervisors did. And it's because of the fact that the exploitable surface area can be well contained even in the container. And this means that once we've actually made this attack profile, 
we can actually start to measure uh, different containment principles, and we can actually use this attack profile to guide ourselves towards a container uh, system that actually minimizes the horizontal profile. This is what things like GVisor and if you've heard of Nabla are doing. I won't mention Nabla too much because how we did it is another 45 minute talk that I have no time for. But now we have a measure, we can actually experiment with different profiles and see, you know, does the containment factor go up or down when we do this? And obviously the back of our mind, the thing I had that I knew would make the headlines, which is what happened when we did announce Nabla is, can I build a container that on these tests is more secure than a hypervisor. I knew if I could do that, all of the news outlets would be phenomenally interested in the statement, not because they understood any of the engineering facts going into this statement, but because it's a hugely controversial statement to make, and news outlets love controversy. So I was looking to be able to make this statement. And also, the other problem is that this defect profile, horizontal attack profile, I don't think this is the e end of the state of the art. I think this is the beginning of a conversation of how we measure security. The point of giving this talk today is, this is how we did the security measurements, but I've got a funny feeling there are much better ways of measuring security, and now we need to find out what they are. The problems with the horizontal attack profile of as a measure is, if no one can exploit your bug, does it actually exist? So the kernel contains many, many bugs, but not all of them are CVEs. Some of them are not exploitable bugs. So obviously, just taking the entire defect profile of the kernel and just saying we have X bugs per line of code, and therefore our attack vulnerability is number of lines of code multiplied by X bugs is untrue, because some of those bugs are not exploitable. And we need to, therefore, to incorporate exploitability as a measure in this horizontal attack profile. So I'm hoping that this will be the next refinement of attack profiles to try and incorporate exploitability. I also suspect this means that the actual interface description becomes the most important factor. So the most important factor for exploiting a bug in the kernel is not actually the number of lines of code you traverse. I suspect it's the breadth of what the system call API actually allows you to do. Now, all of this is speculation, so I'm indulging in hypervisor hype here. I have no empirical proof this is what it is, but for those of you who are interested in this area and want to go off and explore, I think the next generation of measurements of this will actually be somewhere in the interface. So I will tell you now that at IBM we're, we're racing to try and do this because this will be the next press release. But if you want to do it at home, I think this is what you want to be looking at in order to come up with the second generation measure of how secure is a container or a hypervisor. Because some interfaces are obviously inherently more exploitable than others. We have system calls in the kernel that we're forever getting exploits in, and we have some system calls that no one has ever worked out how to exploit. Obviously, some of them are much more secure than others, and we need to factor in the security. And also, if we could get a guarding system that took the insecure system calls and just quietly checked with eBPF or something and threw out anything anybody did that was insecure, we might actually be able to make the kernel interface itself much more secure, independently of whether we use it for containers or not. So there's clearly a lot of research work to actually be done in this field. But what we were actually interested in is producing an alternative container description. So you probably heard the term sandboxing. So in a sandbox, the idea is that you run a container, but you run it in a way that it's not exposed to the full Linux system call interface. What you do in a sandbox is you take certain Linux system calls and you emulate them inside the sandbox. Now this is obviously starting to look a bit like a mini hypervisor running and calling itself a container. But sandboxing has been around for a while as actually a way of getting security containment without actually doing um, full uh, hypervisor setup and full hypervisor image building. And so it means emulating some system calls for isolation instead of doing namespace. So the Nabla containers we built actually use C groups but not namespaces, although technically we cheated. You do use a network namespace because if you don't, Kubernetes doesn't work. An emulation means that the code isn't shared. If I'm emulating a system call within the tenant container, the tenant container is actually responsible for the code in that system call. So I've lowered the horizontal attack profile partially by doing the emulation, but also by actually pushing the responsibility back into the tenant again. 
So another part of our container description was actually working out how we could actually give responsibility for the emulation system to the host. As I said, it's another you know, 45 minute to an hour talk about Nabla containers, so I'm not gonna be telling you how we did this. I'm just gonna be telling you that we, re we recognized that we couldn't just push the problem back onto the tenant as everybody has done with hypervised generations. If we pushed it back into the emulation environment, the hosting service provider actually has to take responsibility for that emulation environment which is what we were looking to do in our run Nabla containers thing. And obviously, it's very difficult to get sandboxing right without committing the hypervisor fault, which is just basically pushing the entire tenant, entire responsibility off onto the tenant. If you're a tenant in a virtual machine, you actually have to understand what kernel bugs are because you're responsible for patching them in your guest environment if you don't want your guest to be exploited. This is the hypervisor fault. The true Benefits of the cloud revolution and containers should be shifting that responsibility boundary from the tenant to the service provider. Because the service provider is the person who has all of these response teams, they have all of this expertise and security. If they can take from you the responsibility for responding to exploits that are discovered or problems in your environment, for you, that is a big win because it means it's all sorts of stuff you no longer need an expert for when you build the container itself. So shifting that boundary is one of the biggest favors that a cloud service provider can do for you. And most cloud service providers today are refusing to do that. They're mostly trying to make it your fault if something goes wrong in your container. And if a good cloud service provider, what we're aiming for is to make it our fault as the person running your containers. If we can take from you most of the security burden, you can concentrate much more on building your applications in a safe way. Obviously, we can't take all of it. If you write a crap application that's easily exploitable, just because we're fixing and finding and fixing all of the bugs in the kernel doesn't mean your crap application is any less crap. So you still have to take responsibility for part of it, but the less you have to take responsibility for, for the more chance there is that you'll actually get that part of it right. And so, at least in IBM research, we regard our job as enabling the cloud service provider to take over management of most of these security problems in the cloud itself. And that actually means that the horizontal attack profile is really useful, unlike in the original IBM Bluemix container, not because um, it's sort of an interesting point to explore technology for reductions, but even if there's no reduction at all, it's no longer your responsibility as the tenant, it's our responsibility as the cloud service provider. So we become the ones who are interested in all this security technology, and you, the tenant, shouldn't care because it's all our responsibility. And the two well-known sandboxes that you may have heard of are obviously Google Gvisor, which is uh, a system that builds uh, kernel system calls in Go, and the IBM Nabla containers. Nabla containers is actually based on unikernel technologies. So it's actually trying to build a library operating system that has a container description. Um, the reason it's done that way is because the team I got to work with in IBM with the unikernel team. And so you always do something that your team is familiar with, which is why we built Nabla containers in the way we did. But the objective in building Nabla containers was to try and get a sandbox container description that on the horizontal attack profile in the shared kernel would turn out to be more secure than a hypervisor. And uh, the interesting question is, did we do this? Uh, Gvisor, so I'm gonna show you some figures for this shortly. Um, I have to explain that when I show these figures, Gvisor actually turns out to be the worst containment system ever. It's actually even worse than Docker on the measure we developed. The problem here is not that Gvisor is doing the wrong thing. The problem is that Gvisor decided to rewrite all of the system calls in Go, which is fine. But what I'm measuring is, you know, the attack prof, the amount of code traversed in the kernel. And it turns out that the Go runtime is incredibly profligate in terms of system calls. So Gvisor itself might be a secure way of doing it, but the Go runtime destroys all that security. If they invested in writing a secure Go runtime that had less system call profile into the kernel, their figures would be a lot better. So on the measure I'm using, the Google figures are actually sort of somewhat inflated, but it's because of why they did it. Nabla extracting unikernel techniques, a library operating system, and fitting them into a single profile gets much better um, response to this because 
if you look at what unikernels do, the library operating system is almost an entire kernel in itself. So we can emulate system calls without ever making an actual other system call down into the Linux kernel. So we can emulate whole system calls in user space without ever troubling the kernel. And this gives us a much lower attack profile. Uh, but obviously we try and keep the standard, so we, we deliberately try to make this a proper container. It's supposed to have proper resource sharing. We're supposed to be using proper Linux management techniques. And as I said, how we did this is another 45 minute talk that I'm not going to go into. But these are the figures. So you see in red, this is Docker. So this is the standard line for all containers. Uh, green is GVisor KVM. Uh, Bigger is worse, so larger attack profile means more ta chance of attack. So this is the, the GVisor problem because of the Go runtime. This is CATA containers doing slightly better in blue again, so it's always doing better than Docker. And the orange is the Nabla containers. And as you can see, the horizontal attack profile for the Nabla containers is getting to be, it's not significantly better than hypervisors, but in every test it is better. And in some tests it's better by, by at least 50%. So here we actually have built a container description on an empirical test that is more secure than a hypervisor. So what I'm hoping is that once and for all, this puts to rest the security debates about what is more secure, a container or a hypervisor. The answer is neither unless you build it correctly, but if you know what you're doing, I can build a container that is more secure than a hypervisor. And actually, in order to drive home the point, um, CATA containers has an interesting interface problem in the Linux kernel and the way it connects to Kubernetes. Using this analysis in the ftrace, we were able to spot what the problem was. And I sent an intern out and said, get me an exploit inside, so I can run a program inside a CATA container and it will oops the host kernel. Prove to me that this exploit exists. So my intern emailed me his 15 megabyte video of doing it today. Uh, I'm not gonna show it to you in this talk, but we'll be releasing it from the IBM Research Nabla blog to just show how this is. And it's a simple proof of concept where you run this binary in the CATA container, which is inside Docker, inside KVM, and the guest kernel actually gives an oops. So it is perfectly possible, even in a hypervisor system, to find an exploit that will actually get you through to the guest kernel, which is the whole point of this. And we cheated enormously. The reason it works is because Making a hypervisor that runs as a container is difficult. The problem with containers is they, they like to think in terms of file systems instead of block devices. So the, the exploit that he found is that uh, Nabla con uh, Cata Containers has a Plan 9 interface that actually is simply an interface transport between the guest and the host for all file system API calls. So any exploit I can find in the file system API call, the uh, P9 interface in the guest will diligently transport that exploit to the host, which is how we did it. So this wouldn't happen in an ordinary KVM guest because that 9P interface doesn't exist. But what it shows you is you have to be incredibly careful when you set up interface descriptions even if you think you're using a virtual machine and you've bought into all of the hypervisor hype, you may not be getting all of the benefits from this virtual machine. So anyway, what's next? Obviously, the questions we can start asking is, is there some useful way of segmenting within the Linux kernel all of these system calls? If I could separate system calls into separate address spaces that belong to the tenant, I would no longer be able to do an exploit from one system call to another, which might actually be useful. So this is one potential avenue of exp exploring, address space separation. Uh, so run parts of the kernel with user context. The Linux is going to scream when we try doing this, but it, I think it's an interesting way of researching as well, because again, it's separating the kernel system calls into things that can't be used to exploit the shared surface area. And obviously we can use supervisors like Linux security modules to correct interface defects. Now we actually are starting to measure where the interface defects are. I think we could actually start to have a scientific exploration of can we craft an LSM that carefully protects all of the system call interfaces much more efficiently than all of the current LSMs? Because, in fact, all current LSMs are still based on the security hand-wavy stuff of, we feel these interfaces are insecure, so we're going to protect them. And obviously, we also have to look at what about the vertical attack profile. As I said, the job of the hosting provider is to reduce that VI the vertical attack profile, not necessarily by reducing the whole attack profile, but just by reducing the tenant's responsibility for it. So we have to look at ways we can actually move up the stack and make more of this the responsibility of the host than be the tenants. This is also something we're actually looking at. 
But anyway, I have two minutes, I'll leave five minutes for questions. So conclusions are, there's really a lot of exciting process to be made simply exploring how we measure security. Once we have a measure of security, we use that measure to guide us as we build container descriptions. Instead of doing all the hand-wavy crap that everybody's done for decades, we now have an empirical scientific way of guiding the secure building of containers, the secure building of security modules, and even the secure construction of system call interfaces for Linux kernel. But this field is at its beginning, it's not at its end. The measures I showed you are very, very crude. They produce certain things that are perhaps not reflections of accurate reality, even though now, finally, I have an empirical way of comparing them. I think we need to see second and third generation refinements of this before we're completely happy saying, this number that I've got as the attack profile is really a true representative of the true security hardness of that system. I think we still have a bit of a way to go. So we found an initial measure, but there's a long way to go in finding the real measures. And I think there's even more exciting advances to be made in terms of how do you secure containers, because this is my field. This is what I'm interested in. I expect to have many more interesting blog posts about uh, how, how I've developed a container system that is way, way more secure than a hypervisor, not just 50% more secure than a hypervisor, and it preserves all of the interesting container properties. And obviously, the real point is we need a whole lot more research into this field. This is a new field now that everybody should start to get interested in if you're interested in any security property of your system at all, because what we're looking at is trying to give you an empirical measure of how secure the system you built is. And anybody who's actually interested in security should in some sense be interested in this measure. So with that, I'll just say this was, uh, as Jake, Jake reminded me, my web-based presentation using JavaScript, HTML5, CSS3. Now, in addition to being a kernel developer, I'm a web developer, and I'll say thank you, and I believe we have five minutes left, and in those five minutes, I'll ask for questions. So thank you very much. And while answering, I'll also set up for the next person. Uh, just, just a question, James, in the uh, terms of, so if a new security vulnerability occurs in the real world, uh, outside of your like, research thing, have you a way to make sure that your model has some way of capturing that? Like, are you still reiterating how you measure things based on what's happening in the real world as well? So the question is, how does my model of security relate, relate to reality? And the fact is, as I tried to explain, it doesn't really. All it is is a measure of how many defects do I traverse as I execute this code. And I don't know if those defects are exploitable or not, which is the real world thing. So, so bad guys, hackers, don't, they, they run through the kernel trying to find these def defects. But for every exploitable defect they find, they've probably thrown away about you know, 50 unexploitable bugs that are sitting in the kernel, and I've just counted all of them. So I have, and also, if you look at correlation of CVEs to system calls used to exploit them, there are certain system calls that are really hot in the exploit paths, and certain system calls that aren't. So this is the interface problem. There is definitely, um, something we're missing in this measure that we've done, that th this, this, if you call into this system call, you are inherently much more exploitable as an application than if you don't. And we have totally missed, our, our measure is blind to that. So that's why the, this measure is, it's the first attempt at doing a measure, but it's by no means perfect. And how far off from perfection it is, I won't know until somebody does a second refinement and I look at it and say, my God, we were off by a factor of 10? I am surprised. Or perhaps we're only off by a factor of 50 percent, who knows. But I have no way of giving you an honest answer as to how far we're off, because I just don't know. Is, um, the, is the, the, work, the work that you've shown so far, is this, is this publicly available that someone can yep. go so reuse the Yep, so all of the, the work data. we're available is at github slash nabla, I think it's nabla dash containers. I should have had the URL on my slides. If you don't find it there, just do a search for nabla on GitHub. Turns out that nabla is a pretty unique search term, so you will just find it. I, I mean the work on um, how you the uh, profiles that you created and the data uh, that yep. you generated. So all of the stuff, most of the stuff about, so my blog, my Hanson Partnership blog has a lot of the 
uh, proof points about the attack profiles. Um, the people who run the Nabla GitHub account are also the unikernel people. They're somewhat proud of all of their techniques. So a lot of the initial techniques that went proving this and the code we used to do the F-trace measurements in the kernel are also up on that GitHub account. Uh, they're the ones with the fewer stars. So if you look at our account, we've got, you know, hundreds of stars on the Kubernetes bit, but we have lots of these weird and wonderful little things that have no stars that are all the code we use to do the proof, code we use to do the measurement and everything else. Thank so you. it is all mostly done in open source up there. Just curious, you said that you measured uh, the, the attack profile for IBM Bluemix with other cloud-based systems? Uh, actually, Is no, we didn't. So by the time we'd com completed this measure, the Bluemix cloud had already been discontinued. So what we measured was an approximation of what the Bluemix cloud would have looked like. So I never actually measured this on sure. the true Bluemix Vis -vis cloud. Sure, vis-a-vis other hypervisor-based clouds, including Google and... No, Is no, that what so... Your target so was? Uh, or was it IBM-based cloud? We, we would get into incredible shit with SLAs if we went around measure, uh, publishing measurements for other clouds. Sure. Everybody has a, a EULA that says you're not allowed to do this. So we produced in our lab environments that we thought exactly replicated what the cloud was. So all of this is done in lab copies of the cloud. None of it is done in real clouds for our exploits. Um, some, of the, um, some of the stuff that we've actually done has been done in the, the second generation Bluemix cloud, which is now called Armada. But the dirty secret to that is we actually reintroduced hypervisors into Armada. So we're no longer currently running a bare metal container cloud. Yeah, I, th I think containers running on top of Linux can be more secure because than hypervisor because they have more defense mechanisms, for example, and your common kernel has CFI and other, a bunch of contributors are contributing. So I wonder, like, how, because you mentioned you have planned to extend your metrics, but how can we take into account the defense mechanism, even though there is a exploit, <sighs> it doesn't mean it's exploitable if there's a defense mechanism inside Okay, so kernel. the essence of this question is about passive versus active defense. Yeah. And the point about all of the measures here is they're all measuring passive defense. So it's all something that somebody's come along, coming along to try and exploit. I haven't put any measure of any active system that goes, up, goes out and tries to find and kill attackers, sort of like the viral defense system for containers. So none of that figures in any of this research. This is all about passive defense. So I agree that adding active defense could, in theory, make you look better. And in fact, a lot of the LSMs, the sec Linux security modules, are active defense modules. The problem with them on the measurements that I make of how many system calls you're traversing in the kernel is that every time you activate an LSM, your system call profile goes up. So on my measure, it makes it look like your security just got worse. So there is obviously something in active defense as well that has to factor into this. So like I said, there are many avenues for exploration in this. Interface descriptions is the one I, I think I'm most interested in, but active defense is another one that everybody should be going off to explore. How do you actually incorporate an active defense measure into this attack profile? And I have no answer for that currently. So if you believe the security module guys, and some of them are big enough to beat me up, so you should believe them, active defense is actually a significant contributor to the security of your container, and my measure is just blind to that as well. Like I said, this is a first generation measure. It may be off by a factor of 10, it may be off by 50%, I have no idea. But at least I have a measurement. Nobody else has a measurement, that's the point. Uh, we, you're, the, you're the MC, how many? Okay, we, I think we're, we're over time, so I'll be out in the corridor if you want to. Uh.